I always, you know, when I interview a politician, I always prepare my questions with my audience in mind. You know, uh, you were talking about audience figures. Um, uh, as far as the pandemic was concerned, our audience figures in the morning uh, trebled uh, in the week uh, at the start of the pandemic, and we had 10 million a day across all platforms um, during the course of 2020. So I know that there's a lot of people at home who are watching and are saying to us, come on, you need to nail him on this. Um, my mother is in a care home, and she is surrounded by people who have coronavirus. I can't go and see her. She might die. I won't be able to go to the funeral. So I, was, I felt very passionate about it, both as, as a broadcaster, but also as a mother. Um, and also I've had, sadly, friends and loved ones who have perished as a result and succumbed to coronavirus. So I, I, I did feel very emotional about it, but also I tried to keep that emotion out, leave it at the door, check it at the door, because I needed to nail politicians. And I see that as my job. Do you think, you mentioned the press conferences earlier. They began with journalists asking questions. It then changed and the public was brought in. Did that, in a sense, sort of, I don't know, signal a change in the media's role, certainly in terms of how the government viewed the media's role? Yeah, I mean, it just felt like a dilution of the kind of, you know, when, when I was a lobby journalist, you would be able to have, there was a sort of, period where you'd be able to do close questioning of the government's official spokesman and the or spokeswoman and they would know exactly what was in the prime minister's mind this was under tony blair all those years ago and you felt that you came out of that lobby briefing better informed and you had information to impart to your viewers these zoom press conferences were frustrating they went on and on because there would be questions from all and sundry and yet there wouldn't be follow-up, so you wouldn't get to ask your particular, you wouldn't get that sort of close scrutiny. And it was just an incredibly frustrating business, and it did feel like a dilution of accountability. I would say, to answer your point specifically, I, I think it's fine that members of the public can ask a question of the Prime Minister, and why not? You know, he's directly elected, or, or certainly yeah, his, yeah, agree, his, yeah. you know, his, his MPs but are directly a format, elected. A but I have no problem with that happening. Well, I, I suppose... Uh, I don't know what's going to happen as far as the daily news briefings are concerned that we're looking to um, start after. Go when, American. When, yeah, <laughs> all, all very American and it's not necessarily going to be a government minister every day or the prime minister every day. And of course at Sky News we've got 24-7 air to, to fill so we will cover those on merit but we are not saying that we will automatically carry that news conference every day whether you know at four o'clock or eleven o'clock or whenever it might be we will still be looking for those ministers to be held to account in a much more yeah. robust robust fashion yeah, as well but does the suggestion that gonna, that's going to happen offer up some insights into how the government sees the relationship with the media going forward it's a two-way street you know if they want to have that broadcast they need broadcasters to uh, be on board mm. and also just to clarify i think it's great that the public can ask a question of ministers the prime minister you know, brilliant, but there's a forum for that. And, you know, these were supposed to be press conferences where the press got a chance to, you know, clues in the title, the press got a chance to ask See, what ask I would the call questions. them news conferences, and I think that, you know, <laughs> we have to agree, with, dis agree to I'm disagree on this. I'm an old newspaper you know? journalist. Yeah, well, so am I. <laughs> uh, so I would call them a news conference, and I have no problem with uh, uh, members of the public holding politicians to account as well, uh, but also there is room for both, I would say. So did we hold the light, you know, Chris Whitty, Patrick Vance, did we hold them to account in the same way as we did the politicians? Did we not need to do that? Was that not our role? I'd love a few more interviews with them. So would you, I. Yeah. But you've been asking and... <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we do get the experts on. Uh, I've, I can't remember. I've probably interviewed Chris Whitty. I've interviewed a lot of people. I, can't, I haven't interviewed him specifically during this pandemic. I would love to if he's watching Chris any time, <laughs> loads of time on the telly box for you, whenever you fancy it. And what about that following the science? That's something we've heard a lot about. You've talked to a minister, one, certainly one minister about following the science, I'm sure more. But that, that phrase, we're following the science, became a bit of a mantra through this. And yet, as you're saying, science is not one, you know, one view. Yet following the science became, well, what did it become? It, it evaporated. In the end, it was politics that took over, as it was always going to. I mean, they're informed by the scientists, of course, but... At the end of the day, these incredibly difficult life or death decisions, and I accept what Kay is saying, these are, you know, you don't envy the politicians making these decisions, but in the end, the politicians have to make the decisions informed by the science, but I think they're no longer 
led by the scientists. They've taken back control, to coin a phrase. Yeah, that was a turning point for Therese Coffey, actually, on my programme, when she said the scientists might have got it wrong. So she was basically throwing them under the bus. Um, was she right to do that? Don't know. Don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But I still think we are tiptoeing through the raindrops when it comes to COVID-19. We don't really know at this stage. Of course, we're going to hold people's feet to the flame, but we, we don't know. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave, do we? We don't know where that's going to leave us. We don't know whether there's going to be another lockdown. We don't know what that's going to mean as far as um, the econo economy of the country is concerned. We're not talked about, talked about economists, but you know, don't know. We know more than we did. Yeah, we're sitting we still here know being enough. barroom experts. Yeah. We just don't know. And what have the media got right? What have the media got wrong? Oh, <laughs> have we got another half hour? <laughs> <laughs> we're nearly there. <laughs> yeah, what have we got right and what have we got wrong? I think we've informed. I, I, sorry, exactly. That's I was, I was yeah. exactly what I was going to say. You know, we've done our best, our level best, under fire on occasion, when the country was uh, terrified to go out and all they wanted to do was listen to every single word and take as gospel what the government was saying. We held those politicians to account. So we got that right. Uh, what did we get wrong? Uh, well, I mean, just what, what we got right, I agree completely on informing. And I do feel really proud that people have placed their trust in public service broadcasting at a time when, you know, I think people are realizing that what they see on social media is not the whole story and so I, I feel proud that um, public service broadcasting has risen to the challenge what do we got wrong I mean I remember um, I'll be honest an early interview I did with the health minister Helen Waitley and I was you know I was sort of quite angry about what was going on and I was pretty robust with her I didn't think she was as briefed up as she should have been and I think at that moment I probably misjudged the tone there. It was a very hard balance to strike between the audience, um, you know, people wanting to trust the government, as we've discussed, and trying to scrutinise the government and hold the government to account. And I think at that particular point, I hadn't reacted, responded to that. So it's just treading that balance. What else have we got wrong? Um, I'm sure there's, you know, if, if members of the public or our, our audience were sitting around the table, they would, they would have a whole list of things. Uh, we don't go to work thinking we're going to get that wrong. You know, we go to work to try and uh, inform and educate as best we can. Is it been a very hard story to cover? You know, it does take a toll on everybody covering this story, I think. I just wondered in personal terms, how do you, do you, do you have people you turn to adv for advice? Have you needed help to cope with this in any way? Well, I've got to say, you do have an emotional response um, as a journalist, as anyone else. I remember once um, just about to do the headlines and I hadn't actually seen these pictures that had just come in until we did the headline rehearsal and it was that awful, awful picture of the 13-year-old boy's coffin being lowered into the ground by people in hazmat suits. And I remember just feeling myself starting to well up because I just, you know, you've, you've, you have a son, I've got children as well and I just remember having a very emotional connection to that story. And obviously, I think you do leave your emotion at the door, but I think you also have a human and humane response to the scale of what we're reporting. And I think you need to do that as a journalist too. And that was the image actually that uh, Matt Hancock said that he'd seen on TV. And as a result, he changed the rules so that people could actually uh, be at the gravesite when they were burying their loved ones. So I suppose, you know, when you were asking earlier about what the difference that broadcasting can make, I think that actually, you know, politicians mm -hmm. do have a heart. They, they do watch the, the news at night and throughout the day as, as, our, as, you know, most other people in the country do. And as a result, it can make a difference.